Hello, everybody. I'm Phil from Element 14 Community. Thank you for joining us today uh, on uh, the 29th of September, um, or even on the VODs. Uh, today, we have James Hughes, Principal Software Engineer, Raspberry Pi. Hi, James. How are you doing? Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you. Good, good, good. So uh, uh, for anybody that's never used this platform, we're on On24 here at Element 14. You can uh, submit a question on the box on the left-hand side. That is a live box. Uh, we will be taking them on. Uh, hello from Robert, who's just saying hello. Gabrielle saying hello. Welcome in. Um, the question box is live. We will try ask them at the end if we have time or during if they're relevant. Um, uh, the way this platform works is you can click and drag any of the windows to any size you want. So if it doesn't quite work for your device, you can just drag it and off you go. On the right hand side, we do have uh, URLs over to the Element 14 community and Raspberry Pi's documentation. So you can click through and learn a little bit more after this. We do have a series of Raspberry Pi eBooks that you can go uh, and download for free uh, with the same registration you use to get here. Um, oh, uh, we have John, we have another John, uh, we have Moyad, uh, all coming in and saying hello. So thank you very much for everyone saying hello in the Q&A box. Um, this is all live uh, for your attendance. You will also get a certificate if you just uh, answer the very simple questions below in the, in the, in the quiz. Um, but other than that, I'm just very excited to hand over to James um, because I'm very, very excited to hear more about the RP2040. Uh, James, please take it away. Uh, well, thank you very much, Phil, for that introduction. Um, my name is James Hughes. As uh, as we say, I'm a, I'm a principal software engineer at Raspberry Pi. I'm not the principal software engineer at Raspberry Pi. I'm just one of them. There's a lot of very clever people here who can, uh, can claim better titles than that. Um, I'll try and quickly go through who I am and what I do here. Um, I've been working for Raspberry Pi, I think it's about six years now, maybe, maybe coming up to seven. But I've been involved since actually before the first Pi was released. So I worked at Broadcom with Eben, uh, not quite, not in the same team. I was in the applications team there. Um, but uh, then I got involved and was helping out in the forums. Um, so I've been volunteering for them for, for, for a long time before I actually joined the company. Um, I was uh, sort of, what have I done since then? Uh, I was the first person to get a Bluetooth adapter working, GPS adapters, and this was on the actual prototype boards, not on the actual release boards. Um, I'm the software engineer who wrote all the Raspi CAM applications as well. So Raspi Steel, Raspi Vid, that sort of stuff. That I did while I was volunteering. Um, since uh, I joined the company, I've been a bit of a all-rounder, no, no specific uh, target area. But um, I've worked on the multi-monitor multi support, um, LCD panel sorts, all sorts of things. And now I work in the applications team, which is a team that's only been going for about a, a year and a half. Uh, actually, part of the hardware side of the, of the company, although I am a, a software guy, hardware just goes over my head most of the time. Um, so what do we do in the applications team? Well, we, we're really a technical support uh, team. For industrial customers, although we do obviously uh, veer out into into other areas as well, um, we I write software for the production lines. Um, I run the Powered by Pi program. For those of you who are familiar with that, it's a useful program if you've got a product that uses a Raspberry Pi of any sort, RP twenty forty or the, the main Pi range. Um, we help out with trade shows. Uh, we were at Embedded World earlier this year, which went really well for us. Gave away twenty five thousand. Picos, which uh, we'll talk about them a little bit later. Um, and we've just had a recent partner event where a lot of uh, our uh, resellers, uh, design partners and things came along and they had a good time as well. So what, have I, what do I know about the RP2040? I haven't spoken about that yet. Uh, I was involved quite early on writing some very early test software when the, when the ASIC team was still designing the chip. I've written some of the, I wrote some of the functionality in the, in the SDK. Um, I did all the oxygen uh, comments in the code, so there's an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of uh, oxygen in there that uh, that's uh, that you can blame me for, and uh, quite a few of the, of the example codes, um, usually to do with little LCD displays and that sort of thing. So uh, that's my Pico. Oh, I also wrote the Pico project generator, which is a thing to try and make it easier to start the Pico project. I won't be talking about that uh, during this one. So that's me. 
Oh, I should have put that slide up, I suppose, but there you go. I uh, got the date wrong, unfortunately. So let's start. Let's talk about the RP2040. So what is it? Well, it's a microcontroller. Um, so if you ask 10 engineers what a microcontroller is, you'll get 10 different answers, I suspect. Um, the way I look at it and the way we look at it here, it's, it's a computing device that connects the world of software to the world of hardware. So allowing software developers to write software that interacts with the physical world in the same sort of deterministic, cycle accurate manner as, as, as digital logic would. Um, so they're sort of in the bottom left-hand corner of the price performance space. Microcontrollers outsell main big processors by a considerable amount. They're the, the sort of workhorses that power the digital transformations. And um, the RP2040 is our first uh, microcontroller. Um, what we hope it does is bring uh, our values of very high performance, low cost, and ease of use into that microcontroller space. So that's a, a very brief introduction of what I think a microcontroller is, and uh, I'm sure you I'm sure you guys and girls have a very different, a very different idea. But let's uh, quickly talk about the RP2040, uh, the name of it really, RP, that's fairly obvious, Raspberry Pi, the two stands for the number of cores, uh, the zero stands for the type of core, in our case we're an M0+. Plus. Uh, the four and the zero at the end are both memory sizes. Not an obvious memory size. That's based uh, the, the, the calculations there on the slide. So four means 256K. In fact, it's a tiny, weeny bit more than that, but that's what the floor is for. And on the RP2040, we've, like I said, 256K, but we don't have any non-volatile memory at all on there. So no flash or anything. Might like to look at a quick picture, quick X-ray of the chip itself. It's quite interesting. I was looking at this uh, only this morning and thinking to myself, cool, aren't the, the processing cores are tiny compared with almost everything else? And uh, I, th I find that quite extraordinary. Um, the SRAM is obviously the, the, the real big ticket item on, on the die itself. Um, but you can have a quick glance around and see what all the other bits and pieces that I'll be uh, talking about later on in, in, in this talk. So you can tell that it's actually quite a large amount of memory. I think we not unique, but it's quite unusual to have so much memory on a microcontroller, and that's one of our one of our unique selling points, let's say. So let's have a look at a bit more detail of, of, of actually what's on there. This is a sort of uh, a block diagram of the of the device. Um, we will be going into a lot of this stuff, not in a huge amount of detail. Unfortunately, you can't. You, it's a week's worth of training course, I reckon, on the RB twenty forty, which which we're trying to squeeze into squeeze into an hour so we can't go into massive detail on most of this stuff i'll try and give an overview of a lot of these things but um one thing you can note from here this isn't just a powerful chip the m0 cores are quite powerful and we, and we clock them very highly for, for their for the design but the bus fabric and the peripherals around that are designed to really give you a very high perform performance um the RAM itself is uh, is uh, uh, in six independent banks. We have a connected switch, the bus fabric in the center there. Um, so it means that all the cores are arranged around that and a lot of stuff can run in parallel. The DMA engine can run in parallel. So it's a very, very high performance processor, especially at the price we sell it at. That's uh, for those of you interested in the bus fabric, it's a, it's a fully connected AHB crossbar for those of you who are into their our, our, our processors. So how do we package it? Just one package at the moment. It's a seven mil by seven mil QFN. The device itself is 40 nanometer, which is pretty, uh, pretty small, not as small as you can get. Um, some of you may be thinking, well, 40 nanometer, isn't that one of the processes that has supply chain problems at the moment? Uh, not, not for us. Um, whether it was uh, excellent planning or luck, we have ordered a lot of dyes up front and they're waiting to go. So we can make, I think, by the end of the year, we can we can make up to 20 million devices. So uh, we're in very good supply situation with regard to this particular device. Not so good on the other on the other on the other stuff, the, uh, the Pi fours and things. But uh, this particular device is in, is in very good supply. <clears throat> We've recently requalified it to a higher uh, temperature range. So you can see from here we go from we're, we're qualified now from minus 40 to plus 85. We found we had a lot of feedback that said uh, when our, with our original temperature range, I think we went from zero to about 70. Um, we need it. We need an extended range. So we did that testing. We qualified it. And now 
it can run at those uh, extended temperatures. So that's that's good news. Um, I won't dwell very very long on this one. It's basically just a, a little comparison of uh, the RP2040 with some other cores, with other um, microcontrollers, all with a very similar M0 cores. But so uh, you can see that our big uh, a big difference here is the speed with which we run the device. Uh, 133 megahertz is the uh, qualified top speed. Um, we actually send it out by default, or the, the SDK runs at uh, 125 by default. We have a lot of RAM compared with some of our competitors. Um, we have uh, some secret source called the PIO, which I'll go through a little bit uh, a little bit later. Similar sort of uh, GPO sort of stuff, and some other peripherals there that I will um, sort of briefly go through uh, a little bit later. <clears throat> there is one thing at the bottom there that you you will see. We're very cheap, but the one above it. Do these other cores run Doom? Well, we do. Um, it's a it's a it's a funny benchmark to use, but uh, the guy who designed the SDK is a very very clever chap, and uh, he's actually got a port of Doom running on this microcontroller, which is which is really quite an impressive feat. It, um, the uh, it's all blogged on the, on his blog, um, so if you want to look at that, uh, then it's well worth a go to see how he's used all the features that are available on on the RP2040 to speed things up so much that he can actually both generate uh, video, VGA video, plus the, uh, the sort of simulated 3D that uh, is required to run Doom. So that's uh, that's quite an impressive bit of work that's well worth looking at, just to give you some idea of the uh, the performance levels that we can get out of the RP2040. Uh, James, um, yeah. with Doom, uh, so for yeah. anybody in the audience, this is the second uh, webinar we've had in this series. The other one will be linked below and is linked on the event page. Uh, Roger, who uh, hosted the first one, uh, showed a demo of Doom uh, running in a video of it. So if anybody hasn't seen the first webinar, please go back and watch that and you can actually watch uh, Doom running. Uh, yeah, that, that's my only interjection. No, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, a lot of people who will have seen Roger's one will have seen we've had some duplicate slides. Hopefully, we'll start to, we'll start getting a bit more interesting for those people uh, in a few moments. <clears throat> so, how do we design for the RP twenty forty itself? Um, as with a lot of our stuff, uh, we provide a reference design. Um, is that that uh, rendering you see on your display at the moment? That is the reference design, a minimal design example. All the uh, KiCad files are available there. Um, they're available actually on our uh, product information portal, our pip.raspberrypi.com. This contains all of our publicly um, published documentation, except for some data sheets, which will end up in there eventually, but they're not there at the moment. Um, the data sheets are at uh, reddatasheets.raspberrypi.com. There's a huge amount of information in there. One of the things, one of the plaudits we had when we launched the RP2040 was the, was, was the quality of the documentation. It really is good. I probably should have said I wrote, I did, did do some of that uh, early on as well. So, um, but uh, that was a that was a very much uh, our documentation team and the engineers involved. So, you, what you're doing when you're reading our documentation and our data sheets is you're reading what the engineers actually wrote, which is which is pretty good. Right. Okay. So that's a quick glance at uh, designing. We'll get. We'll do a little bit more on that a, a little bit later. Programming is a bit of an animation for you. So the obvious or the easiest way of programming these things is you plug them in while you're pressing down the boot select button on the Pico. We'll come to Pico in a, in a moment as well. It appears as a mass storage device, and you can just drag your compiled code directly to the Pico. It will reboot itself. And in this case, this was a blink a blink and light uh, demo. So that sort, of, that sort of happens and reboots itself and starts up automatically. So it's a very easy thing for beginners to get into. You just plug it in with the boot set button, select button, press down. It appears as this mass storage device. You just drag and drop your code to it. Now, there are there is an alternative way of doing it, uh, which we'll come to a little bit later when we talk about debugging. But uh, yeah, really easy to use. So I've mentioned the Pico a couple of times that in a, uh, this is our development board, effectively, um, although it is uh, used a lot by uh, third parties, actually, as is, they've built them into other products. Rather than using a bare RP2040, they can use a Pico. It provides a huge amount of uh, 
you, it means you have to do less work. You just solder it down to a circuit board. And then you can see we have castellated uh, pins all around the outside. So it can be soldered down. It's why it's flat underneath as well. So it can just sit down on your own circuit board. So that's the Pico. We very recently launched the Pico W. So there's a picture of one of those, again, with the same castellated uh, PCB around the edges to make it easier to solder down. But this one has Wi-Fi. This has been a, a, a really good seller as well, um, competing with some other products out there in the market that, that have Wi-Fi built in already. This one's up to $6, but for $6, you get the RP2040 and you get the Wi-Fi. It's an 802.11b, G and N Wi-Fi chip. And the important thing about this is that it's a modular approval. You can see that the device has a little can on it. I think that helps in getting this sort of approval. And it means that that approval goes into the product that you put the device into. So you don't have to then go through the quite, uh, quite difficult process of getting your device, um, the device compliance that you need in order to sell into, into, into other markets that modular approval. That was, again, a, again something that came from the uh, feedback we received from customers on the P, uh, sorry, on the Pi Zero and the Pi Zero W, that sort of, those devices with the Wi-Fi. People wanted this modular approval, so it made it so much easier to get their devices qualified in, in perhaps in the markets they want to sell. So we haven't mentioned about programming these things and uh, what languages that the... Uh, the Pico uh, goes up very briefly. Uh, so it's C, C++. We provide C and C++ and MicroPython. And we saw from the drag and drop uh, example earlier how easy it is to get from that sort of uh, code from your code base built and then onto the devices. So but, uh, there's MicroPython and uh, various other things that I'll briefly touch on in a moment. So where do we get these? Well, we're on a we're on a Farnell uh, webinar here, so that's a, that's a good place to get them from. Um, just Farnell, one of our distrib di distributors, so uh, you can buy them from there. We also sell these devices direct, actually, um, it, but uh, only to business customers. We sell them in reels. You can see on the uh, the little uh, screenshot on the left there. Um, that's a small reel there, and you can see. Uh, how we sell them in, in that uh, in that format. The reels come in, uh, I think, at three and a half thousand sizes, and you get the prices down in quantity um, to a little bit low below that seventy cents we see on the slide. Um, so if you really uh, buying large quantities, that you, the device itself, I think, will, will drop almost to fifty cents per device. So given the performance that you get, I think that's uh, a real, really quite a quite a lot of bang for your buck there. So basically, get it from any of our resellers, um, Farnell or resellers, or from Raspberry Pi Direct if you're a, if you're a business customer. I uh, should add actually that the Pico is also available now in in this sort of uh, reel, um, basically the same plastic uh, sort of format, uh, the cellophane over the top in a big reel. So you can buy Picos as well if you if, if your product is using the entire device. Okay, so let's um. We've done a bit of a, a sort of quick preview of, of the device and where to get it from and uh, sort of brushed over a lot of things there, I think. So let's have a, a slightly deeper look into what the device actually has on it. So I squared C. All devices have to have I squared C. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of synopsis IP in there. Um, it's worth noting that so nobody or very few people design processes entirely from scratch. They generally bolted together from intellectual property IP from third parties. So in this case, the I squared C block comes from Synopsys. Um, it could be a master or slave device. E either, either, either of those um, I squared C peripherals can be master or slave. So you could actually have it as a master uh, talking to some downstream IoT sensors, perhaps, and, but also as a slave upstream. Uh, standard mode, fast mode, fast mode plus, 10-bit um, addressing in master mode. There's also a transmit butter, buffer there, a 16-element transmit FIFO type of thing, and uh, both on the transmit and receive. And 
it can be driven from the DMA. So using it can be extremely efficient. It's also a, can, can generate interrupts as you would expect. The SPI, again, two peripherals. Um, this is a Motorola uh, compatible, well, Motorola National Semiconductor Microwire and Texas Instruments uh, serial interfaces, which, which covers the vast majority of the market. Again, either of those SPIs, I believe, can be master or slave. The PWM, now this is a block that we did design ourselves. Um, and it's, there are eight what we call slices. Um, you could, could say, call it a slice or a block. Um, and each slice can drive two PWM output signals. Um, but what's quite interesting about these devices, they can also be used to measure the frequency or duty cycles of input signals as well, because they have an input line. So that's, they're, uh, they're quite a, the guy who designed it, I had to get him to explain how it all worked. And uh, it's really quite a sophisticated system. You think PWM is just uh, pinging a line up and down, but actually these ones are quite, quite clever and well worth looking into. So with eight by two, we've got 16 PWM controllable PWM outputs, all, and which can be spread all over whichever GPO is on, uh, that you want. UART's time two. Everybody knows what a UART is. Um, pretty standard IP block there. Um, one thing to note, the Pico is a 3.3 volt device. So if you are plugging in UARs, make sure you're at uh, you're at 3.3 volts, not 5 volts, which some, some, some devices do. So you don't want to blow up your Pico by uh, plugging it into a 5 volt UR. Timers. So there's a global microsecond time base on the system. It generates interrupts based on this time base. Um, so it's a single 64-bit counter. Um, which is incremented once per microsecond. Um, this is 64-bit. Remember, the M0 is a 32-bit core, so we have to have uh, some uh, latching registers to read it. So when you read the low byte, or sorry, the low word, the low 32-bit word, it locks the upper one so that you don't get any sort of race-free, race, race conditions when reading those two peripherals. Um, there are four alarms on the device. Hold on. It's got weird on my laptop. So it's your know, four alarms on the timer, which you can use uh, to interrupt at, uh, at whenever you want. Note that they only work on the lower 32 bits, those alarms. So that, I think that gives you a two or three days worth of uh, look ahead on, on the alarms. <clears throat> there is uh, software in the SDK to, if you want the longer alarm delays to, to deal with that. We, we have one quick question, uh, which is relevant yeah, at the moment ahead. from uh, Ralph. Uh, Ralph's asking uh, what the uh, real-time clock accuracy rate is for the RP2040. Um, I'm sure we could send Ralph to some specs, but I don't know if you know it off the top of your head. I, I don't know how accurate it is offhand, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you very I'll much. I'll briefly mention the RTC in a couple of minutes, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but if I didn't have that information in my bit of data, so uh, I'm afraid I can't help with that one. Um, well worth asking. It's worth saying at this point, that if you do have any questions that I can't answer today, um, try our forums. There's a dedicated PICO and RP2040 section on our forums. If you don't get answers there, there's an email address coming up at the end of the uh, presentation um, to, to talk directly to us in the applications team. And obviously, uh, well, uh, no to way. throw to throw my own marketing in there as well, the, you can ask in the Element 14 community where we have over 850,000 uh, uh, engineers who are always up for uh, answering questions. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of information out there in the old internet. <laughs> okay, so we were talking about the timer. Um, it's actually a one microsecond reference generated by the watchdog timer, which in turn is derives its... Um, its input clock from the reference clock, which is usually directly connected to the crystal oscillator. So it's a bit of a pass to get down there, um, but that's how it works. Um, one thing to note, 64-bit counter, because it's a 64-bit counter, it effectively cannot overflow. It's, I think it's a thousand, over a thousand years at the one megahertz refresh rate, so it's never going to overflow. So effectively it's, it's monotonic in practice. Um, on the RTC, we mentioned that uh, just now with the with the, with the question on the accuracy, I, I, as I said, I don't know the answer to that offhand, um, but uh, it's worth noting that the RTC, the, well, the, the Pico and the RP2040 themselves don't have any sort of battery backup. So if you are going to use an RTC and want to re retain the uh, clocking over a power down, that, that you have to sort of incorporate some sort of battery system on your device. Um, so it's worth remembering that. 
So again, the RTC has an interrupt function or alarm interrupt that can wake the processors up um, and also wake up the, uh, the clocking, uh, the, the crystal oscillator or the ring oscillator on the, on the device to wake them up from what we call dormant mode, which is our low power mode. I think it's worth mentioning at this point that this dormant mode is not that low power. It doesn't, it's uh, we, we can't compete on, on the low powerness with some other devices out there. This is something that we've taken on board um, and will uh, fix in any possible future devices. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's definitely something we're looking into. Right, the ADCs the analog to digital converters, we have a single analog digital converter, which is muxed over five inputs. Four of those inputs go out to the GPIOs and uh, on, uh, I think, uh, 26 to 29 or something, something like that. Um, one input, the fifth input, is stays internal to the device because it's attached to an internal temperature sensor. Um, so effectively, we have a four inputs, uh, a four ADCs, um, the sample rate by default is 500 kilo samples per second, running off a 48 meg clock internally. This can actually be overclocked. I, I very recently, only in the last couple of days, saw that somebody had got up to 1.5 megahertz, 1.5 meg samples per second um, by, by overclocking the device. So uh, that's quite interesting. It's a 12 bit ADC. Um, there is a gotcha in the uh, ADC, after the device was launched, we found a problem with very specific values going into the ADC. Um, so, but uh, I won't go into the, what the actual issue is. It was to do with uh, the capacitance in the FPGA was slightly uh, needed to be changed slightly for the actual chip. Uh, but this is all covered in the errata in the documentation. So check out the data sheets. That's in section 4.9.4, I think. Um, so that would describe where the issues lie with the ADC. But for the vast majority of people, it's uh, it's it's you can ignore it. There's uh, right, there's, so... there's quite a few people interested in the ADC. Sorry to cut you off there. There's yeah, a little okay. bit of delay between us. Um, uh, so I, I believe you might have just covered that. But Susan asks, uh, has the ADC data reading spike issue been addressed? I believe that may be what you've just been referencing. Yes, um, that is exactly exactly the case. Um, uh, we haven't respun the chip just to change that. It's a very expensive business to respin a chip like this. Um, so at the moment, that errata is still present in the chip. Okay, and and then the, there's the one which I'm I'm going to phrase more as uh, a, a request. Uh, uh, Al Zandi uh, says we need more ADCs. Uh, have you got any more planned for the future? So I, I, I think that's that's consumer feedback. Yeah, um, that's an interesting one. I've, I'll, uh, I will take that to the ASIC team. Thank I will you ask very them. Much. Obviously, as, as everybody knows, we never discuss future products uh, until they come out here at Raspberry Pi. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, we do pay an awful lot of attention to what we hear, and what we read, and what pe how how people comment. So uh, these are all interesting thing, uh, all interesting uh, feedback uh, for us. So and and it does get fed back to the ASIC team. It goes gets fed back to Eben even who who basically decides everything. Um, so that is uh, mm -hmm. yeah, good feedback. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, so that's a, a very brief whiz through the per peripherals, the main ones. So, but there's uh, three other things um, interesting here. The execute, execute in place cache. Now, this allows external flash memory. As, as, we, as I said earlier, there's no flash memory on the device. So if you're building your own board, you have to incorporate your own flash memory. It's QSPI. Um, but the execute, execute in place stuff uh, is really quite interesting. It allows external flash memory to be addressed as though it was internal memory. So... Uh, there's bus bus reads in the, in the memory um, memory window are translated into a serial flash transfer, and then the re the uh, result is returned back as if it was a memory read. So this process is entirely transparent to the to the, to the cores to the M zeros. Um, so the processor can actually execute code directly from this flash memory. It doesn't need to be loaded into RAM first. Hence the execute in place. Another advantage of this is that the 
that can be cached. So we have a cache in there. You, you've seen it in the block diagram and on the X-ray. And this accelerates the average bandwidth and, and improves the latency of, when reading flash to, to not quite as fast as uh, to running it from RAM, um, but, but a very, very good performance boost by using the caching over the executing place. Okay, let's uh, SIO. This stands for the single cycle IO block. This is uh, a little block. This is one of one of the bits I wrote some test software for right at the beginning of the project. Um, these are peripherals that require low latency deterministic access from the processor. So um, they're accessed via the M0 plus's IO ports, which is an auxiliary bus port. And so they can perform extremely rapid 32-bit IO read and writes. And so what the SIO provides is intercore FIFOs. Um, we're a twin core device. You need some way of talking between the two devices. Um, so we have intercore FIFOs. There's 32 hardware spin locks in the SIO block. Also some integer dividers. So there's uh, actual hardware to improve integer divide performance. And there's also two interpolators. Um, so uh, these are, well, a good example is the, is the Doom uh, Doom stuff where the interpolators were used in the part, in, as part of the 3D rendering system to interpolate between values. So the software engineer who did that we used all, all the parts of the, of the chip to try and improve performance right down to, to using these interpolators in the SIO. The SIO also handles things like uh, GPO setting, clearing monotonic seed, uh, GPO stuff. So quite a useful little block there. Right, so the last one on, on this slide, we've, we've spent quite a lot of time on it so far, but uh, this is the PIO. Now, I'm sure a lot of people are quite interested in the PIO. Um, this is our, well, one of, the, one of the secret source parts of the, uh, of the chip. Um, it's two programmable blocks there, which are exceptionally specified towards IO. Let's have a quick look at, uh, at a block diagram of how this sort of bolts together. So the PIO is dedicated connections to the bus fabric, to the GPO and the interrupt controller, so very, very deterministic. Um, and why do we have it? What's it there for? Well, interfacing with other digital hardware is hard. It happens at very high frequencies due to the amount of data that needs to be transferred and has very, very exact timing requirements. And PIO is our response to the problems of, of bit band interfaces, really. You can do that sort of thing by just program and programmatically pinging GPIOs up and down. But then you're, at, uh, you're right, the code is very complex and at uh, the whim of uh, something else happening in the system. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on PIO. There's a spectacularly good explanation by the guy who designed it in the in chapter three of the Pico SDK data sheet. And that is well worth reading. Um, I will go into a little more detail, but I'm trying to get that in first um, because just to remind you that, that our documentation is very comprehensive. And this is a, an area where it's very difficult to describe how this all works uh, over, a, over a one hour presentation. But anyway, there are two identical PIO blocks in the RP2040. Um, and the PIO, PIO is it's, it's programmable in the, in the sort of same sense as a processor. So you can program it to support various, I, various IO standards. Um, so we've already got examples for 8080 and 8800 parallel buses, I squared C, I squared S, SDIO, SPI, DSPI, QSPI, UART, DPI, VGA, that sort of thing all driven by this PIO system. And remember, this is independent of the, the actual dedicated hardware for things like I squared C and SPI that we, ha that we have on there as well. Each PIO block has four state machines, and each one of those can independently execute sequential programs to ma manipulate GPIOs and transfer data. But unlike a general purpose processor, they're very, very highly specialized towards IO um, with a very, very determined uh, focus on determinism, precise timing, and very uh, close integration with the other fixed functions in the hardware. So we make these uh, state machines programmable but, uh, in a software-like manner. We, 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 we didn't want to do something like uh, CPLD, a complex programmable logic device, because 
uh, because of the complexity, we wanted them to be software controllable. Um, the PIOs fit into a sort of similar sort of area as, as putting in a CPLD, but because they're programmable, they can be reprogrammed to, to do whatever you want. So uh, that's really why we chose to take this route. So each one of these state machines is responsible for setting and reading, setting and or reading uh, GPIOs, buffering data to and from the processors or from the DMA subsystem and telling the processor via uh, IRQs or for polling when data, or t uh, data is uh, arrived or when attention is needed. <coughs> so it, prevents, it presents uh, quite a familiar programming model, um, quite a simple tool flow. Um, it's not easy. Um, I'm not by no means an expert on this, but it is very, very performant, very, very, very flexible um, because of the way that, that it's been designed. So, for example, we can actually output DPI from a PIO. You use a couple of uh, DPI, uh, uh, sorry, a couple of the uh, state machines to drive it, and we can get 360 megabits per second out of PIO, deterministic megabits per second. Um, during the active spec scan line periods, that's running for a 48 meg system clock. So in that, in this particular DPI case, and all these are available as examples in our GitHub repos, um, one state machine handles frame line, frame and scan line timing. Uh, one generates a pixel clock, and well, sorry, and another one generates uh, the pixel data and uh, unpacking run rate scan lines. It's really, really quite a, quite a, quite something to see that uh, this tiny little core. With the, with the addition of these POs doing things like DPI. So all of we, these we, uh, statements, oh. sorry, go on. Oh, no, 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 uh, please, please finish up. We have one question about the PIO state machines as well from one of our top members, whenever you're ready as well, please uh, finish up your thoughts. Okay, I've just, got a, I've, just, I've just got a couple of pages on the PIO and, uh, and then I'll, then I'll try and answer the question. Um, so all the inputs and outputs are mapped, can be mapped to the GPIOs, um, which is 30 on, on the, uh, 2040 and, and it's all completely independent and simultaneous so you've got one PIO uh, state machine talking to one GPIO and another one to another one there's, there's no sort of uh, uh, contention between the two so we talked about it being a programmable it only has nine instructions and you might think how on earth do you write uh, a I squared C uh, system in, in nine instructions but actually they're quite clever instructions uh, you can see there there's not very many jump wait in out push pull move irq and set but we have things like um each instruction could be modified we have delay and side set stuff um oh it's worth noting that each one of these instructions is exactly one cycle long so that's gives us this determinism uh, just one cycle per instruction um so they can be modified with the delay, delay and side set functionality we see in this this uh, this table. Um, and what does that actually mean? Um, you can specify in a state machine how much of that uh, bit field is delay, how much is side set. So, um, so what is, what is a side set? I've mentioned it two or three times, but it's it it can assert a constant value onto some GPIO. So you've got may have an inst instruction like jump. But while the jumps are happening, it will also set a GPIO or multiple GPIOs. So some of those five bits will be delay, some will be side set. So the delay is basically after the instruction is executed, then a delay for a certain number of cycles. So you can see how these this minimal set of instructions can actually be quite sophisticated. So we also have uh, somewhere in there we have auto push and auto pull. Now we have the push and pull instructions. They are for pulling data to and from the M0 cores into FIFOs uh, that feed into the PIO. But we can do that automatically. This is just a, because it's such a common operation, we put in a special bit of uh, hardware in, in, in the PIO that means that when it gets to a certain point, if the buffer becomes to a, a certain, sort of semi-empty, it's nearly empty, it can be automatically filled up by the hardware. So you don't actually have to write certain instructions, which is useful because actually each state machine or each PIO block, sorry, should I say, only has 32 uh, instructions. And you have to spread that over the all the state machines in that PIO. But when you consider the, com the complexity you get out of just four or five instructions, then uh, that's, uh, it, whilst it might, might sound like a bit of a limitation, it generally doesn't uh, appear as a limitation in practice. 
So there's some POC dividers in there and PIO as well. Generally, these processes run much faster than your communication system might want to run. So we can divide out the clocks, very accurate clock dividers to make sure that uh, if your process is running at 125 megahertz, actually the PIO divides itself out and can run much more slowly for, for the slower communication protocols. This is a six or 16 bit integer, eight bit fractional value. So it can actually uh, divide out extremely accurately. So a little bit on how we actually program the PIO. Um, we've written an assembler that takes these instructions. Um, we have a lot of boilerplate library code that uh, you can, once you've got your instructions compiled, which you, just comes out of our make system, um, it, uh, we, it uploads the programs directly to the PO, starts them running and all that sort of thing. So we've tried to make it as easy as possible to get these PIO programs into the system. As I said earlier, it's not an easy, uh, it's not easy to write PIO programs, but once you get the hang of it, they are extremely powerful. We've already implemented some useful ones anyway, things like UART, SPI, and I2C. We've already written PIO programs to do that. So if the two I2Cs or the two SPIs or the uh, two UARTs aren't enough, you can then uh, leverage the PIOs to, to add more of these if you wanted to. Uh, right, uh, what was that question, Phil? Uh, so, uh, from Shabazz, who's one of our top members on the Element 14 community, um, uh, who's very interested in this and working through it, uh, when or if will there be a uh, complete simulator available for the PIO state machines? There's a bunch on the internet, uh, but it's unclear if they're entirely complete in the simulation. It's uh, something people want to see, apparently. Okay, that's, quite, that's an interesting question, and I, I did see it actually up front, and I completely forgot to talk to the guy I wanted to talk to about it, who would have been able to tell me whether we're planning one. As far as I know, we're not planning one ourselves. I do know that um, there is uh, at least one internet-based, net-based one that, uh, as far as I can tell, is is pretty pretty good. Um, but it's not something that I'm aware of. We're working uh, internally. On. Okay, thank you so much. And we, we have uh, a couple of really quick ones on PIO. It's very, uh, people are very interested in it. I mean, is it specific for the RP2040 or do other ARM MCUs have it as well? Uh, no, this is a very much specific to the RP2040, the PIO blocks. It was something that was developed in-house by um, our team here, uh, including one very, very clever chap who uh, who's basically started as an intern only a few years ago and uh, is now... Uh, doing that sort of thing. So really high quality ASIC design and software design work. So he's uh, in his mid twenties, I think now, and uh, obviously much cleverer than I am. <laughs> and I'll give you one more uh, um, before I let you carry on, if that's all right. Um, Alexander yeah, asks, uh, should the PIO uh, be programmed each time when the chip is powered or is it saved in some sort of non-volatile memory? Uh, yes, it's programmed each time you start up. So your code, um, we'll just um, upload it as uh, as it's as it starts up. Thank you so much. So yes, it's effectively stored in your program binary in your flash and will be uploaded uh, when you start up. Okay, I've just noticed that um, I'm whizzing through the time. I've still got loads of slides left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Um, what about the software? <clears throat> so we've talked about the hardware. What about the software? So. We provide a C and C++ SDK, um, which is really just a very thin layer over the hardware. Um, we, we don't want to um, provide too much boiler uh, sort of heavy duty code. There are some areas where we have done so, where we want to provide some features that are available on other devices or other systems. So, excuse me, but it's mostly a thin layer over the hardware. So very shallow, just a, effectively rather than having to write to a register with bit patterns, we'll provide an, a, a very simple C API that converts the, uh, the parameters of function into those bit patterns so you don't have to. We're CMake based, um, which was an interesting design choice. Uh, some people disagree with that, um, but I'll go through why we chose that in a couple of seconds. Uh, the SDK works on all the Raspberry Pi devices. In fact, that's mostly how I use it. I use a Pi 4 to compile the code. Works on Linux, Windows, and Mac. Um, Everything, all the SDK, all the example code is in our 
GitHub account. Uh, the SDK is in Pico SDK and the examples are in Pico examples. Um, easy to find, just look on our, our, uh, on our GitHub there. There's also a MicroPython port, which we really hope introduces a lot of people to the microcontroller space. Um, this was originally developed, uh, we did a little bit of work up front and then it was taken over by the uh, MicroPython devs. And so that is actually maintained by, by those guys now. Um, so if you've got any really difficult questions about MicroPython, they're the people to ask. So with regard to the design of the SDK, it was designed specifically with the knowledge that the RP2040 is a microcontroller, an embedded controller. You're, you've got limited CPU, you've got limited RAM. Most people nowadays, software guys, have never had the problem of limited CPU cycles and limited RAM. But it's a particular way of working, and the SDK is designed to, to try and make the best use of those resources. I can't go into a huge amount of detail. As I said, we're rapidly running out of time. Um, so I'm not going to go into a massive uh, sort of description of the SDK and, and APIs and things, but I will try and cover a couple of points that I think are quite interesting. I said we use CMake. So why do we choose CMake? Well, it's a very widely supported make system, um, both in IDEs and on the command line. Um, it's easy, relatively easy to use, certainly a lot easier than, than defining your own make files um, with a simple, simple make list file. Um, you can specify how your application builds um, or multiple, multiple versions of your application build even. Um, and it produces files, the CMake uh, process produces uh, sort of local uh, build files, for example, that can be used by Make or Ninja or, or other build tools. So how does it all bolt together? With, with regard to the code base and CMake, well, we use interface libraries, and these actually collect all the source files, all the include files, compiler definitions, link options, dependencies, and each sort of uh, little library um, is done like that. And that means that instead of actually being libraries, they're interface libraries, they're not actual libraries, they're not pre-compiled. So when you do a build using our system, what you get is it just collates everything from all the libraries, interface libraries that have been defined or requested and will make a single monolithic binary. But that, the interesting about that is because they've all been pulled in as source files rather than libraries, the compiler has a really good chance of making it extremely efficient, both in size and in uh, speed. So that's the reason we, love, we use CMake. Um, it's much easier to do all of that stuff in CMake than it would be in a, in sort of things like a standard make or stuff like that. And you can customize these CMake files very easily and uh, to, to get a very fine granularity on how you want your application to be built, how you want it to run. That sort of thing. So I'll really quickly whiz through this. Um, the SDK consists of a number of layers. So we have whilst I did say that we try and keep as close to the hardware as possible, we do have a few higher level libraries that leverage lower level uh, functionality, things like timers, the multi-core support, there's some utility functions like print, and that's a printf and that sort of thing. Um, these are based on the lower level libraries. We also have some runtime support libraries that again, these pull together um, other smaller lower libraries. So you can just do one library include to, to, to get an entire system that will work. We have the hardware support libraries. This is the majority of the system. These, this is this thin layer over the hardware I was talking about. And we also have a couple of other uh, areas that are worth mentioning, the hardware structs library and the hardware registers. Now, these just provide uh, easy C defines that can be used by the, the hardware support libraries. And these are directly generated from the, uh, the register definitions in the ASIC code. Right at the bottom there, we have tiny USB and, and LWIP. These are two libraries that uh, are larger libraries, um, one to handle the USB that's available on the device, and the other one is for the Pico W. That's the, um, I can't remember what LWIP stands for now, but, uh, or, uh, but it's the library that uh, is used for the wireless device on the Pico W. So that's a very quick skim through the libraries that we provide and how they're sort of bolted together. This is a very, very um, easy slide to talk about how to use all this stuff. 
you can't go through how to use all this stuff in an hour. Um, so I'm just going to point you out our data sheets are getting started with Pico PDF. Um, as I said, we were we got quite a few plaudits when uh, the device first came out just over a year ago, I think now. Um, and I think uh, we, we produce some pretty good documentation. So I'm just going to say, if you want to use this, you're going to have to read the documentation. Um, and it's good documentation. It's easy to read. Um, I don't want to go into any more detail in that. But uh, I will now move on to um, a subject that did come up in one of the questions that was asked. That's not the slide I was expecting. Hold on a second. I pressed the button twice. There we go. Here we go. So one question that does come up a lot is how do you debug these things? I, I've, I see uh, people still out there saying, well, you have to press a button to boot select and uh, you can't debug and, and that sort of thing. Um, but in fact, we've had full debugging facilities and uh, the associated paraphernalia since the, the device was released. Um, you can use a, a Raspberry Pi or indeed another Pico to debug a Pico. And how do we do that? Well, we have something called serial wire debug. This is an ARM protocol, three wires that connect from the, in our case, we'll talk about the Pico, but uh, the exported from whatever board you're using, that you can bit bang from a Raspberry Pi. You can actually use another Pico that provides with some Pico, you run the Pico Pro firmware and that will allow you to have plug your your debug Pico, as it were, into a USB socket on your uh, laptop or something. You can run Open OCD and GDB on that device, and you get debugging on 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 the directly onto the RP twenty forty. This is also a great way of getting code onto the board, um, even if you don't use it as a debugger. But if you're fed up with pressing the boot select button and doing the uh, mass storage device uh, copying and paste copying of the UF two files, the, uh, the sort of resulting binary from our builds. Um, you can use a, a, either a Raspberry Pi or another Pico to actually download directly to the board without having to go through that process. And that's been available since the, since the device was first, first released. Okay, so what have we got here? We're looking at um, how do we design these things. Again, I'm going to refer you to our documentation. There's just too much to go into uh, in, in a, short, a short talk like this. Again, we've got the data sheets. We've got a, a specific hardware design document that will re take you through how to incorporate an RP2040 onto your baseboard. Uh, we have, as we referred to earlier, the minimal minimal board design um, that's available uh, for KiCad. We have VGA, a VGA board design, which is a sort of a resistor ladder of uh, a, a interface to, to provide VGA output on RP2040. If you're interested in the in the RP2040 and building it into a product you might have, but don't have the experience to do it, we do run a, uh, a network of design partners. Again, avail you can, available on our website is uh, information on how to get in touch with those. These are people who have a lot of experience designing Raspberry Pis into third party products. So it's well worth talking to those guys if you have questions or, or, you, or you have a product you want to build with an RP2040 but don't have the in-house uh, uh, ability to do so. I'll note at this point that we don't have the in-house ability to do that either. Um, we have the we have the uh, knowledge, but we don't have the staff. We're a very busy company, and uh, we, we have engineers working full tilt on new products all the time. So we don't have uh, we don't have the time to to design other people's products for them, uh, no matter how much money you offer us. And uh, so that's why we have this design partner network. If you're moving to an RP2040 from a from another device, um, there's a few sort of uh, caveats to to look into. I know a lot of people have moved to the RP2040, not necessarily because of its feature set, but because they can't get hold of other devices. But once they get hold of the RP2040, they find out, actually, this is a pretty good bit of kit. So there's a few things you need to ask yourself. Um, are there enough interfaces? 2i2c, 2spi. But don't forget the PIO, which dramatically increases the amount of interfaces you can stick onto, onto your hardware. Do you have the right power supplies? Do you have the right memory? If you're you coming from a device that has inbuilt memory, then you're obviously going to have to redesign your board to, to take a QSPI flash. That's well worth considering if you're, if you're considering the, 20, the RP2040. Does the device have enough speed compared with your old core? Well, Almost certainly. I mean, if you go back to our comparison table early, you see we were running at considerably higher clock speeds than many other competitors. So almost certainly you're going to be able to, uh, to, to perform to the required level. 
What about the software? Well, the SDK is our own uh, is our own API, so that's not a, that's not on other products. So if you're going to move to us, then you are going to need to do some software work. Um, we like to think the S the SDK is quite easy to use. I've used it uh, a lot, and I find it easy to use. But then I, I presume I'm quite biased. But if you are coming for something like an Arduino or a, whatever device, or the Atmel device or whatever. Um, there's certainly Arduino has been ported. The IDE has been ported to to actually uh, produce RP2040 code. So if you're coming from that neck of the woods, then it's quite possible that uh, you're already uh, you, you've got quite a head start there. And again, I've put a link to the design partners on there. Again, um, really useful if you need to uh, if you don't have the in-house experience to do this. Just approach our design partners. So I've talked a bit about the SDK, but what else outside of our software ecosystem is available? As I just said, the Arduino ID is functional. There's also CircuitPython, which is Adafruit's uh, specific MicroPython port that works on the RP2040. And there's also a number of RTOSs that have been ported and work quite well. I've just um, spent some time building all these and making sure they work. And the ones I got working were FreeRTOS, NutX, RT3, and Zephyr. I think there are others out there. Free RTOS is obviously a very, very popular real-time operating system. So um, that's certainly one uh, in my testing worked really, really well. Platform IO is out there, but there's loads. Oh, I'll go on. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the delay is a little funny. Uh, the, I feel there's one very uh, targeted question from Jan, one of our top members. In the free RTO, uh, RTOS port, low power tickless isn't supported yet. Is that on the radar? Uh, we we internally don't do any support for these third party systems, so I suspect that would be something you'd have to ask FreeRTOS. We're more than happy if the FreeRTOS devs have questions on how to do it, then we're more than happy for them to come to us to ask them. But uh, Thank you very we much. don't yeah. do for these third party products, so I, I can't answer that question because I just don't know what they're up to. Thank you. Um, one question that does come up is things like uh, what other compilers can I use? So we, for example, we use the Keel compiler or we use the IAO compiler. Um, Keel is uh, is backburnered at the moment. If you're interested in that, you'd need to talk to ARM themselves because there's some stuff going on there that I can't talk about. Um, IAR is in progress and we're expecting them to be able to have something uh, in, in, in their uh, in their sort of quiver, as it were, um, in, in the relatively near future. But that's down to them again. And I think I'm about to run out of time. So thank goodness it's the last slide. Um, I hope I haven't been too quick for everybody, but uh, and you found it interesting. But uh, everything I've linked to uh, or talked about is available in our data sheets. Um, use our forums if you've got questions. Use the Element 14 forums if you've got questions. Technical questions from uh, industrial customers, we're more than happy to answer on applications at raspberrypi.com. And uh, to be honest, if, uh, if you need, if you really need a, a quick answer on something, then that would be worth trying anyway, even if you're not industrial. So um, also, for example, if you've got a bit of feedback on uh, on the Pico, on the RP2040, it's always useful to have, have, have that sort of stuff. Obviously, we have an ASIC team here. They're not, uh, they're not sitting on their uh, bottoms twiddling their thumbs. They're all working pretty hard, so uh, we need to keep them fed with ideas. Right, so q and um, I'm afraid I've taken up more time than I was expecting. I think we've got a minute and 15 seconds before the hour is up. But, uh, I'm here, I can uh, stay as long as you need. So uh, if, if you've got any questions, please uh, please let rip. We do, we have we have quite a few. So you're, uh, so you're gonna have to tell me when, when your time is up because uh, we have a lot of people that are very interested in stuff. Um, so first off, people are asking about the slides. I'm gonna make the slides available so you can click on all those links uh, on the event page. So uh, just refresh the original event page that you were on on the Element 14 community and you can click on all the links in, uh, in, in James's presentation. Um, we have a bunch of questions uh, about securing firmware, so I'll just round them up about uh, it from one from Shabazz here, which any way of securing firmware uh, at the moment on the RP2040. Okay, so there is no uh, OTP or no secure zone or anything on the RP2040 at all. Um, this is obviously this was a deliberate design decision. We uh, we could have put it in, but it would then we'd spend another year trying to develop the chip. 
Um, so at the moment, there's nothing in there. So what we recommend is use some sort of TPM attached. At the moment, we don't have any example uh, code or design, PCB design stuff for that. I suspect that will be fixed in the relatively near future, but I can't give you a schedule on it. Thank you. You you, you even ask, uh, answered Shabazz's follow-up question there about a TPM chip. Um, so uh, there you go, Shabazz. That's your answer for that one. Um, let's have a quick look. So you did mention Platform I.O. a minute ago. So Donna asks, is the SDK available in Platform I.O. to make updates and version control between the application and upstream SDK versions easy? If not, are there plans to publish Platform I.O. packages? Uh, that obviously uh, is a is more of a platform IO question. Um, I know we've been in contact with them and we're talking to them all the time, um, but I I don't know the answer to the question. All I can say is that we are talking to them. That's a fantastic answer. <laughs> uh, is uh, Alexander asks is all the software around RP twenty forty open source and what license licenses of the software GPL MIT or something else. So it's Ooh, I can't, I can't, yeah. it is all open source. Um, I can't remember which license it is, uh, but it's a very permissive one. I think it's one of the MIT ones, is it? or is it BS? No, it might be BSD2. I can't remember. Um, it's one of those, but it's a very good, it's a, it's a good license. Um, it's not a copy left license. Um, so you are free to do with code pretty much, pretty much what you want. I think there's some, uh, obviously some uh, copyright type of message you might need to put in. Um, with regard to the documentation, that is uh, a CC no derivatives at the moment. So whilst you can read the documentation, you can't make alterations to it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, oh, they, so they, I'm going to condense a couple of questions here. Uh, with, there's a couple of people talking about communication between the M0 cores. Um, uh, so I'll just go with Martin's question. Uh, what about some kind of thread API so both cores can be used? A bit more of a suggestion. Right. Well, um, we do provide um, something in the SDK to start stuff up on the other core. Um, I'm not quite sure what FreeRTOS does with regards to how it manages that and how it does the stuff between cores. Um, from our point of view, we provide the functionality to basically start up stuff on the other cores, but we also provide API functions for communications over the FIFOs and event systems between the two cores to make sure you keep them in step or uh, make sure they don't trample over each other. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just reading through some of these questions. Internal bus connectors. Da, da. Yep, so that one's pretty much what we've just answered. Uh, well, that, that's that's a quick answer for you. There is, uh, are there any other plans for uh, variants for the RP2040? Yes. And there we go. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, the way that the, uh, the, the, uh, the naming scheme works implies that there may be uh, some other uh, products in the, in the pipeline. I have no idea which particular products might come out or when they're, when they're scheduled to come out. But so obviously we, we look at this all the time and and, uh, and we decide what, what, what the market actually wants. So yeah, like I said, we're not sitting on our hands twiddling our thumbs. Um, and sure. uh, <laughs> uh, Jan, uh, who asked one of the questions earlier, one of our top members of 14, uh, is absolutely plugging their own blog series here, uh, which we love. Um, FreeRTOS uh, does support multi-core out of the box. I'm writing a series about it on the Element 14 community. So, uh, yeah. Um, Excellent. Great news. Jan. Look forward to reading yeah, we it. Love we think it's fantastic that so many people have taken on board uh, the, the RP2040 and so many people are working on it. It's been brilliant. Um, we've got a couple of quick ones. Uh, Emmanuel asks, uh, so what is the best uh, assemb assembly language for the RP2040? Oh, well, it's, well, it's ARM, isn't it? It's going to be ARM. Uh, it's an ARM processor, so that's, that's what you're going to be using. Um, it's a strange question because there is only one assembly language, for, and, that, and that's ARM, so ARM assembly. Thank you. Well, there we go, Emmanuel. Thank you. Uh, uh, I believe that's Ernie, uh, says, in the documentation somewhere, it mentions uh, it can interface to an 8-bit data bus 
I believe through PIO, but there's no example code. Any chance that there'll be example code available? Don't know how well I've worded that one for you there. I don't know the answer to that. Um, okay. The problem we have at the moment is uh, not enough people and too much work. So doing examples of, of, of great complexity can be a bit of a problem at the moment. We obviously were extremely busy. I mean, a lot of people don't realize how small a team we are at Raspberry Pi. Um, the team, the software team that worked on Pico that did the SDK was four people. Wow. And, uh, and I was one of them. Um, but the actual ASIC team was probably another five, if that. So, um, yeah, we're a very small team and spread quite thinly at the moment. So uh, <laughs> we do examples when we can. It's, it's, it, I suppose it's the best answer I can give for that makes sense uh one thing uh just personally i have to say the documentation's always pretty fantastic um we yeah. working for the element 14 community we see a lot of uh you know controllers uh you know products coming through that we get to test in our road test program which you can always check and uh some people do have problems where they have a fantastic product and the the documentation is lacking so it's wonderful to see the the quality of documentation that comes out of raspberry pi like just always so uh well, it's great, whoever's though. ego needs fluffing for that there we go <laughs> I'll, um, I'll okay I'll, I'll i'll give you a couple of quick uh, uh just a couple more before we start wrapping up so anybody with any burning questions now uh feel free to add them into chat or you can comment on them on the event page underneath and we'll make sure that uh, we, we communicate any suggestions or whatever through to, through to James after. Um, do you have a library where I can use the RP2040 to program other microcontrollers without a Pico probe, just SPI to SWD communication? Not that I'm aware of. Um, okay. We basically yes, just use a Pi, Bitbang Pi, to, or I, I use a bit, I use a Pi to Bitbang over SWD and use Open OCD on top of that, and then GDB over the top of that. Um, I've not used the Pico probe, but because uh, I, I just use the Pi all the time. Um, I'm not sure whether, presumably, somebody's thinking of uh, just doing it via SPI, Bitbanging over SPI or, or something like that. Um, and the answer is I don't know. I don't, I've not nothing that I've heard of. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert asks, uh, is it possible to program the RP2040 uh, via the Arduino IDE? Uh, yes, as far as I know it is, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, oh, a self-serving one here from Erin, which I, I love. Uh, great and awesome uh, introduction webinar for the RP2040. Out of nowhere question, where can I get this giant Raspberry Pi giveaway listed on the resource list? Um, so if the link isn't working, I'll check it after the event. Uh, if not, I will make sure we uh, connect it uh, on the event. Um, for James's uh, uh, mind, we're giving away a uh, four and a half, five foot uh, working Raspberry Pi 3 model that we have. And we're looking for the people with the best uh, use for it that we're going to send it to. And there's, a, there's just basically tell us where you're going to put it. We want it to go to a good home. And it's a giant uh, four foot, five foot uh, Raspberry Pi three, which uh, the G most of the GPI pins work, GPIO pins work as well, which is is pretty yeah, cool. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, uh, that that's uh, some of the strange stuff that comes out of the Element fourteen community, and we love it. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for that. Uh, and I'll I'll just wrap up with one final one. Uh, da, da, da. Is the R TC clock derived from a separate clock or from the master clock, says John Alexander. Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I think it's derived from the master clock. But I, I, I have a vague recollection that might you can might be able to do that or I, I think you might be able to specify which clock is which what it uses as clock source, but I'm not sure. But can I refer to uh, refer you to our excellent documentation? Fantastic. Okay, so we, we, we still have, you know, uh, well over 30 questions at the moment. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up. Um, James, it's been a pleasure having you today. Um, uh, I really enjoyed it. This is the second one of our Raspberry Pi webinars. Um, and uh, we've really enjoyed it talking about the RP2040. Um, for anybody else that's joining, you can 
uh, or if you missed some of this, this will be available on VOD on the same link, Video On Demand, on the same link you, you used to get here. So please send it to your friends uh, and colleagues. Um, uh, James, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. I really appreciate well, it. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. It's the first one of these I've ever done, so I hope it went well. It was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, any more questions, anything, any suggestions, please post it on the event. And uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap up now. So thank you very much, James. Uh, and thank you to everybody that attended. Have a great day all. Yeah, thanks, everyone.